All right, hi everybody. Um, so I'm here with uh, Ebby Weiscarver, who's the global head of design at WeWork. Hi, Ebby. And Brad Hargraves is the founder and CEO of Common, which does a lot of different things. But for today, it's the nation's leading co-living brand. Um, I think I think most people know what WeWork is here. I actually, I, I don't know if you knew, but this I think either is or was a WeWork it is building. A WeWork, yes. Right. All these people are just <laughs> checking email. <laughs> but they're all just at a WeWork. Uh, but common, maybe people don't know as well. Brad, could could you just sort of walk us through what it is, what co-living is, in simple terms? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, common is a residential designer and operator, um, and we're best known as being the leading co-living brand in the United States. Uh, co-living for those folks who are unfamiliar, it's basically rebates done better. Uh, so about 25 million Americans live with uh, someone they're not related to, uh, mostly roommates. Um, and we started in 2015 to create housing specifically designed and operated with roommates in mind. Uh, and today we operate around uh, 8,000 apartment units um, and have around 22,000 under development in the US, Canada, and Europe. I mean, that's big, that's a lot, that's a lot of units. Um, Rolling it back to last year in the spring, just to, we had a meeting uh, right as COVID was getting serious, the business of home, and we were like, what does this mean for our industry? And, and just candidly, I think, I don't remember which editor it was, or maybe she'll remain nameless, but was just like, co-living is doomed, we work is doomed, no one's going to want to share spaces, that's over and done with. Clearly, both of you guys are on stage here today, <laughs> so that was not the case. What, what was COVID like for WeWork, to, you know, in the early days and then as it progressed over the last year? Yeah, so I think um, initially, you know, when we were thinking about our spaces, you know, it was definitely, um, you know, an intimidating time. I, I think that um, <laughs> I think that sort of extreme response that, um, you know, no one was ever going back to the office ever, ever again, um, quickly changed when everybody realized that um, your work life balance just disappeared and, and, and it was all work all the time. Um, so I think for us, you know, the, the initial step was really to ensure that our spaces were safe, um, but also sort of being able to maintain the kind of hominess and, and, and the design aesthetic without sort of damaging that and making it feel very sterile. So that was kind of our initial take. And then over time, we were discovering, you know, a lot of the, the companies that did occupy our spaces were, were looking for something, you know, quite different um, in the way of like, you know, rather than heads down offices, sea of desks, Right. You know, it, it is definitely getting into something much more collaborative. So that the activity-based workplace has been, you know, around for a long time, but is now becoming um, very much sort of a prominent um, aspect of, of the design of spaces. So, you know, we're looking at creating more um, collaboration spaces, you know, for, for team events, but also, you know, trainings, things that are... are you know, hard to do remotely, which we all know. How do you curate a space through furniture, through prefabricated rooms, through through you know movable elements to to repurpose space and become a lot more functional of of, of and and create programming you know for for you know why why people need to come back in? Why are people going into the HQ? And I think the advantage we work has had through this is that we have a lot of space and um, you know and now we can sort of instead of sort of ignoring the home as as a as an office opportunity right. we can start to say there's really three major buckets there's the home where you know you should do a lot of your focus work and then there's local we works which are in walking distance from your home or or a lot easier to get to now those become you know maybe an all-access pass or a desk or something you can pop into and use a meeting room and then when you do have a, a formal HQ or these collaboration spaces, they really are serving a very specific purpose. Gotcha. So Brad, Common also was not doomed. In fact, mm -hmm. you guys raised a lot of money <laughs> last fall. Tell me, tell me what COVID was like for you guys and pivots that you made to sort of accommodate you know, this weird reality we've all been in and are still sort of in. Well, first of all, I, I do want to acknowledge a moment, which is thank all of you for being here. After spending 18 months yes. <laughs> doing talks into the void, staring at my computer, yeah. uh, it is really, really amazing to speak in front of an audience again. So, um, you know, for us, there was a there was a real existential moment, as, as Abby said, mm -hmm. at the beginning of, you know, are people going to want to live in cities still? Yeah. Uh, certainly, are they going to want to share space in, st in cities? You know, one of our values that we, that we chose very early on really saved us, which is affordability. We always viewed co-living and the products we were creating through a lens of affordability, that affordability was the most important pillar. It was on a pedestal. And we often would choose, you know, if we had the opportunity to add additional amenity space or add another unit, we would always 
add that other unit that was going to drive the rent down for everybody and make the project much, much more sustainable. We say affordability is the best amenity. And within two months, by May of 2020, people were coming back to cities. We had our biggest lease signing month ever mm. in May of 2020. Wow. Because people were, there were, they were traveling, traveling medical workers. There were people coming in uh, to work in hospitals, work in services, work for the city that needed a place to live. They needed, and you know, we target our rooms to be 30% cheaper than a studio yeah, we in should a similar building, yeah. similar neighborhood, but highly amenitized, furnished with um, weekly cleaning, shared kitchen and bathroom supplies. Uh, so we're providing something that's high quality that gets someone into the neighborhood they want to be in, to the building they want to be in, but at a much lower price point. And there's always demand for that. Right. We should say, when you say affordable, like what are we talking, 30% lower than a, a comparable studio is basically about right. Right. So in, uh, we, we, we have you know, uh, a number of units in, in, in Brooklyn, for example, where right. our prices start a bit below 1000 a month. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. So we, we, we are <laughs> able to hit some good, yeah. you know, good price points, yes, um, even in <laughs> places where uh, rent tends to be pretty high. Yes, that is significantly less than what I pay. <laughs> I, I, the knock on co-living, or at least in the early days, was like, is this dorms for grown-ups? I'm sure you get that question a lot. Why is that not the case? <laughs> well, first and foremost, our median age in co-living is, is around 29. Okay. Um, and we're really looking for, you know, if you walk the spaces, uh, you walk in, it looks like a well-designed conventional apartment that a thoughtful person in their mid-30s might live in. <laughs> um, we're really moving away from the dorm aesthetic. When we built our first building, uh, you know, the general contractor asked us, do you want to bolt the beds to the floor? <laughs> we looked at them like, why would we bolt the beds to the floor? And they're like, well, that's where the bed should be. <laughs> and so, so we've, we've had this like natural push and pull over the years of you know, how much do we control the experience, the design, the aesthetic versus how much do we hand that to the, to the tenant, the person who's living right. there. These are furnished units, but you know, we want the tenants to make it their own, to have control over that. These are adults, these are not kids, these are not students. Uh, these are you know, people who are looking for an affordable, high quality place to live and we have to treat them with respect. Yeah, these, are, these are people with movable beds. <laughs> um, yes. I, I'm, I'm curious, you, you, one thing we mentioned on the aesthetic point, I remember when Common first launched, you know, they, they were beautifully designed apartments. They were, you know, the interior design was sort of lovely. And I remember when we talked earlier, you said that they were almost too designed. Like yes. there was that, what was it, a bronze? <laughs> the something? bronze armadillos. The yeah. bronze armadillos. What was, what was that? So when we opened our first building, we, we, you know, we, we really wanted it to be kind of photo shoot ready on right. day one. And, and we, didn't, we didn't know what staging was. Yeah. So we actually <laughs> loaded like knickknacks onto the shelves and art onto the walls in every single unit, every single suite, every single room. Uh, and you know, our, our first building had four common areas and each one had this bronze armadillo. Uh, on the on the shelf, right. and uh, you know, as we grew and we had multiple uh, buildings, you know, the tenants would play games against each other where they would steal the black the, the, the bronze armadillos from each other's Should have uh, bolted them down. Areas. Yeah, and so we had to bolt bolt down the yeah. bronze armadillos. Right. Uh, and 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 you know, that was an example of you know, I think us erring a little bit more on the side of heavy-handedness in design. Right. And we've really backed off over time and focused on you know, what are the hard fundamental things that we need to include to create a great experience to make move-in day relaxing and fun uh, where they're thinking about decoration, they're thinking about right. art, they're thinking about personalization, not, oh, I have to go buy a dress or I have to go buy a mattress. Right, you're leaving blank space for them to fill this in. Is, these are long-term tenants. You know, our average, uh, a majority of our tenants are on 12-month leases. Right. Um, so it's, it's not a short-term hotel-like place to stay. Right. Abby, what about WeWork? You know, uh, this is just my memory. The company is over 10 years old at this point, or around 10 years old. I remember when it first launched, there was, you know, the spaces were very well designed. They were very, like, bright and buzzy. I was like, cool young people will be there. I want to be there. Like, is that still part of what WeWork is trying to do? Tell me about how the design aesthetic has evolved over the years. Yeah, I mean, I think for one, you know, when we originally started 10, over 10 years ago, we were very focused on kind of small startups, you know, and it yeah. was very about, very much about having your office, you know, sharing that space with others. And, and you know, as we've evolved over time, you know, we're very much now targeting 
um, you know, larger member segments. So, you know, much, much larger um, members that are, that are not just looking at one office, but they're actually looking to distribute their entire portfolio over WeWork. And so when we think about our design aesthetic, you know, I think um, we have grown up a little bit. <laughs> and I think, you know, more importantly, like we've, we've sort of focused our energy also on making sure um, you know, the quality of our spaces, um, the performance of our spaces is improved. You know, we, we think a bit more about, you know, privacy. I think in the original days, like, um, you know, Miguel had, had thought, you know, the glass partitions, um, you know, really sort of creating that level of transparency. Right. You know, you see your neighbor, <laughs> you'd see your neighbor in the lounge, you couldn't avoid them, you had yeah. to strike up conversation. And, you know, I think now that we're moving into to much larger companies that, that you know, that, that need that level of privacy, they they need, you know, the proper video conferencing in their meeting rooms. Acoustics are important. Ergonomics are important. So I think it's the important thing for us is to remain light and airy, but put that layer of sophistication and, and do it through furnishings and, and do it through, um, you know, improving the overall performance of the space. Right. Like when you first started, it was startups and now it's like major yeah, corporations. They're not, they don't care quite as much about a cool neon sign. They're yeah, like, and I mean, chair comfortable. Exactly. Yeah. And I think yeah. as we're looking now, you know, I mean, we we, you know, we when we think about what's happened through COVID yeah. is, is, is thinking even more about like that level of flexibility, like how can we be, um, you know, how can we create a very similar experience in, in all of our WeWorks um, and, and, you know, we have that hospitality layer as well um, and create that consistency, but also be able to provide the actual office space that um, each of these company needs. And, you know, when you know, and a couple examples, I mean, Coinbase has, has left their HQs entirely and, 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 and committed to us in, in all access memberships. So they, they just want to make sure their employees have a place to go. Whereas, you know, on, on another, um, a company called Duolingo is, is actually done a combination where they have sort of dedicated space with us, but also leveraging the all access. So you start to see like, we're, we're able to adapt and curate our offering for those members and, 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 and grow and change over time but you know the sort of aesthetic and 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 the vibe can can always sort of stay the same yeah gotcha you know it's interesting uh, wellness is obviously a buzzy topic in design I'm sure literally everyone on stage today will say the word wellness <laughs> um, you mentioned that it's important to you uh, in, in designing new spaces to, to you know to focus on wellness I'm curious in your mind what actually does make a difference and what's window dressing like great there's the wellness room yeah you know i mean what 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 makes a difference yeah how do, I mean, how do you study what makes yeah a difference too? Talk yeah about i mean i think uh, you know it's it's interesting because i think right now um you know we've talked a lot about i've been on a couple of panels where we talked about like company culture mm -hmm. and and really sort of what people are after and i think obviously being able to meet meet people meet your employees where they are and where they're comfortable is extremely important, but also to be able to ensure that, you know, another big topic is inclusion and making sure that every space is able to um, accommodate the needs of, of our members. So whether that's a mother's room mm -hmm. or whether that's a, a non-binary bathroom or being able to ensure that we have spaces that, that meet everyone's needs. And when it comes to wellness spaces, yeah, you know, we, we do have prayer rooms, we do have wellness spaces. And what what we're able to do through our community team is really activate those. So now it's not just a window dressing, it, it actually yeah. becomes something that we are, are facilitating and, and encouraging and, you know, and, and pushing sort of events and making sure, and we actually, you know, even just our outdoor spaces have been a huge sort of asset to us you know, in, in, in the time of COVID to, to really facilitate outdoor events and, and be able to you know, get people back in a safe and comfortable way. So Brad, does Common care about wellness or is that, uh, is, tell, tell us about that. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So, so from our vantage point, it's really about the feedback loop of design. Mm -hmm. So we're fairly unique in what we do in that we're a vertically integrated design firm. We have about 20 architects and interior designers on staff and property management company. Now, in most of the multifamily world, those are two separate planets. Right. Uh, you know, you have interior architecture, interior design that is involved when a building is getting built and then it gets delivered, it gets hand over, handed over to the property manager and there's no feedback loop that goes from leasing, operations, you know, renewal rates, right. back into the design of the next building. Uh, if anyone does that, some developers, but they don't have the breadth of data sets that 
management companies do. Right. So one of the ways we set Common up is as a vertically integrated, not developer, those are our clients, but as a, an operator, a manager, and a designer. So really what we're looking at are, you know, some of the big things like what amenity spaces get used, how do those spaces get used, when during the data they get used, but also some really wonky things that are very important. I mean, how many gallons of hot water do you need per tenant in a shared space? Right. You know, what do how many you actually is it? need uh, to put in, yeah. in a kitchenette yeah. um, to, you know, make a you know, great experience for, say, a hotel conversion? We're doing a lot of conversions right now from, you know, hospitality to residential. Um, so all of these little long tail things that really make the space not just beautiful and not just look great in the leasing photos, uh, but also work really well where someone wants to stay there for the long term. No, and I think that's such a great point, especially because in the commercial design world, as you said, there often is this like split. It's like, great, here's your building. I'll see you, you know, in 10 years or whatever. Totally. In residential design, a lot of residential designers have really long-term relationships with their clients and they do get a lot of feedback. I think it makes them much more attuned to, uh, to what works and what doesn't. We're gonna open up for questions in a few minutes. I think the microphones are gonna be set up in, in these aisles here. Um, but, but before we get there, I'm, I'm curious, you know, this idea of the, the shared economy, it might be a buzzword, I don't know, but when both of your companies first launched, I do think there was rhetoric, maybe it was just us bad people in the media blowing it up, but there was this sense of, oh, WeWork is all about people, everybody in together in this community, like in a kind of utopia working together and starting startups together. And there was a little bit of that around common too. It's like everybody's you know, collaborating and stuff. And it seems like a lot of what you guys are talking about now is like, this is practical, like this works. I mean, is that a fair assessment of kind of where we are in the shared economy? Yeah, world? I mean, I think, you know, what's interesting is that um, I feel like this idea of shared economy is, is almost expanded in a different direction, maybe less mm -hmm. about you know, I still think community matters and, and bringing people together matters. But what we're seeing is we actually um, have been have get, gotten a lot of interest from landlords uh, around sort of in, in a product we're calling Asset Light, but where they're looking to actually take their, um, you know, empty spaces and convert them into, um, you know, co-working or, or shared office and, and now tucking it under our platform. So, and, and, and now we're sort of like building these management agreements and sort of expanding the sort of shared economy and, and partnering up with, with, um, with companies or landlords that we, we may not have prior. So, you know, and I do, but I do think it's very much about being practical at this point and making yeah. sure people feel genuinely comfortable um, in their space. And, you know, because I think we've all sort of hit this very low level of feeling unsafe and, and being able to address that first. But I do think that, you know, you know our community team, our hospita hospitality is consistent through all our WeWorks. And I think that still can facilitate that connection, just I think in a different way. And, 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 and using those people to make people feel comfortable, like someone's listening, you know, they can, right. they can vent their concerns rather than maybe, you know, facilitating a huge party or something, yes. you know? Yes, I've been, <laughs> I, I went to some of those early. Yes. We were, we yeah, were, they were, they were fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not suitable for now, yeah. Brad, what do you think about just, that? I've just had said that and say, for us, it's still extraordinarily important. The majority of our tenants are moving to a city for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of them are looking for a community. They're looking for a network. They're looking for, at a minimum, a friendly place to move. But nobody signs up for community in the abstract. Nobody mm -hmm. says, like, yes, I want community. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll take one. They, they, yeah. either, they either they, they, they sign up or, 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 or lean into specific communities. Right. And so the two directions we're taking with that is, one, um, thinking about community as a retention tool, which is incredibly important. People, in our view, come for the affordability. They come for the convenience. They stay for the community because they find a friend group they like. And that fundamentally is about interest matching. It's about, hey, here are five people in the building who are interested in running. You can do a running club every, uh, every Saturday morning. We're not arranging that. The tenants are arranging that. Mm -hmm. It's also about creating niche brands, even brands that may never get that big, mm -hmm. that are serving very, very specific audiences. So uh, a year ago, we launched a brand called Millie, uh, which is focused on families and the needs of families. Um, I have two young kids myself. We raised them here in New York City. Um, and we love getting to know other families, going to the playground together, sharing some of the uh, you know trials and travails of uh, raising young kids in an urban center. 
Um, and so we now have opened four mil milli buildings in the past year. They've done incredibly well, kept at 100% occupancy. Um, and they're, you know, the first one just opened with daycare in the building, uh, you know, shared childcare as an option. Um, and it's very focused on, on families as an audience. So you have a lot of kids in a pretty, uh, you know, you know, re you know, one residential building. And that is super attractive for a lot of families that are looking for camaraderie yeah. uh, in, this, uh, in this, this journey of raising kids. Yeah. So that, that, that's like we don't, um, it's still very small in the common portfolio, but um, we're really excited about that brand and where it goes from here. Yeah, we were just sharing some stories about that journey backstage. <laughs> I have an eight week old, so it's kind of the early stages of the journey. Um, really quickly, we're gonna take questions in a second, but w what's next for WeWork? What's the big thing that you guys are working on now or what's the big challenge that you're working on right now? Yeah, so I think, you know, I'd mention um, this asset light. I think, you know, that's a, a big next step. I think also, um, you know, just moving more and more into flexibility. We've, we've partnered up with Steelcase and really sort of thinking about, um, uh, you know, how can we leverage prefab rooms, demountable partitions? How can we sort of become even, you know, um, expanding this sort of activity-based workplace? And, 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 and I think also, you know, introducing uh, some new technologies. I mean, we've, we've partnered with a company called Arct for, for hologram uh, technology where you're able to... to kind of zoom in from um, virtually through, through uh, you know, if you're in London and, and, and you know, you have a, an audience like this, we could pull someone in um, through this hologram sort of technology and, um, you know, and also amenities. I mean, I think, you know, we're, you know, we're thinking about, I mean, similarly, you talk about childcare, but, you know, how can you bring more and more amenities back into your space, like it, it, whether it's food delivery or, or, you know, picking up your laundry or, you know, any of these services so that when you're going into your office, you have these amenities that can, can make your life easier and, and you're, you're sort of engaging in less sort of activity outside of the, that space and, and really sort of promotes convenience. So that's definitely sort of where we're headed. Brad, what's next for Common? You know, for us, it's we've gone through pretty tremendous growth. We've tripled right, our units yeah. under management um, over the past year. Um, we've also increasingly begun managing a mix of co-living and conventional units. Um, and one of the reasons is we see uh, co-living as, you know, within a given building, a great opportunity for people to get into the building. Within two years, they often want to move into a, you know, studio, a private apartment. They get a significant other. They want to get a pet. They earn a little bit more money. So not pushing back against that, but actually managing more mixed buildings. Uh, you know, we're a management company, as I mentioned, so we work with, you know, a wide swath of, you know, large local, regional, and institutional developers and owners. Um, so we've really kind of continued to add to that, that client roster um, and work with a wider swath um, of buildings, both under the common brand, uh, as well as uh, two other brands that we've launched over the past uh, 18 months, Millie, which I mentioned, focused on families, and Noah, which is focused on uh, workforce housing. Oh, okay. um, and that's actually the fastest growing segment of our business today. Oh, interesting. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? There's a microphone right there. Oh, we can also just, um, I'll, I'll do the microphone first, sorry. Say, say your name and your company, by the way, if you, if Hi, you wouldn't mind. Um, Hi, my name is Nicole, I work at Compass. Um, I was curious if either WeWork or Common is thinking about innovation in terms of materials. Um, you know, that are antibacterial, et cetera, given that durability required um, in residential and commercial real estate, um, such as yours. The question, if anyone didn't hear that, the question was about materials innovation, if you guys are working on that. Uh, maybe, Abby, you wanna start? Sure, yeah, no, I mean, I, we've definitely been exploring. I mean, we work with um, sort of all the top furniture companies and, you know, always thinking about how to to make our spaces safer and what's easier to clean. I mean, certainly durability is is always been an issue. So, and ergonomics certainly an issue. But you know, definitely thinking about the surfaces that we put, you know, beyond just furniture, but throughout the space on on countertops and and on walls, and thinking about you know how can we uh, you know make these you know a little bit easier to clean and 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 certainly sort of safer going forward for sure. Yeah, we're, we're always, I mean, that's often done with our partners. We work with some, um, some great partners, great vendors on the supply side to build out our spaces. Um, so we're always looking for uh, innovation, for new things. Um, we like to be on the cutting edge of that. I'm curious if, uh, if, if, if there are any like specific materials or learnings that you guys could share. I just, is there anything that jumps out at you? Don't use this kind of, <laughs> just a little, little pro tip for the audience, if anything jumps out at you, Abby, in particular. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, you know, I, I've mentioned Steelcase a few times, but, you know, what, what's exciting about our partnership with them is, is you know, they, they sort of have their own lab where they're exploring. Yeah. So, you know, I think what we've discovered in all of this is, is you know, being able to partner up with, with the brains <laughs> of, of certain companies and, and, you know, really think about how, how we can leverage the, the, the things that they've already learned. And quite honestly, I think that, um, you know, a lot of this innovation has been happening over time. I just think COVID has made it um, all the more important to actually get into the market because oftentimes these, these elements are a bit more expensive. Um, but certainly, you know, we, we, we are working closely with them to, to transform, especially a lot of our office furniture. I think that um, is, is really where we're sort of doubling down right now. Yeah, it's not so much a materials sure. answer specifically, but we're really interested in um, basically uh, furniture that can increase density and utilization of space. Mm -hmm. um, so what Ori is doing uh, is super interesting, mechanized walls. Mm -hmm. uh, what Room is doing on the office side, I think is very interesting, creating effectively modular spaces. Um, you know, we've been really forced into running working space. Um, you know, we're never going to be a co-working operator. I've said, said that for a long time, except now everyone is working out of their right. home, which is our spaces. So facilitating that through uh, basically innovation and design um, is incredibly important for us. Yeah, the modular thing is, I yeah. think is gonna grow a lot in the years to come. Sorry, oh, was there another question or? Uh, no, this is a question for Brad from one of our virtual audience members. Um, they're curious what the shortest lease someone can rent and given the Delta variant, will this change anything deal with, dealing with shared spaces? Yeah, so the, the shortest lease term we offer right now is, is three months. Um, we do work with some short-term rental operators to offer uh, shorter spaces, but we've really seen anything shorter than three months is a very, you, you get a really hotel-like environment, people coming and going. Um, and look, we've been, we've been dealing with COVID for the last 18 months. The majority of our, uh, of our employees are essential workers. We ramped up cleaning. Uh, we've been very focused on ventilation in our spaces as well. Uh, none of that has changed. Um, and, you know, for us, it's really about continuing to provide the, the fundamentals um, of affordability, uh, of convenience, um, regardless of what the, uh, what the situation is. And we still see demand for, you know, a lot of our audience would be living with roommates one way or the other, um, and we're giving them a way to do that in a more reliable way. Awesome. Thank you. I think we have time for one more quick question. I saw somebody. Oh, hi. There you go. Sorry. Hi. Uh, my name is Erica. I work for myself, but... Um, <laughs> I kind of have a hot topic question for you guys, but I'm just, I guess I'm just curious what your response is to the criticism of these shared economy co-working spaces that are actually kind of glorified real estate companies. Cause in my mind, I'm a bit concerned that the only people that profit are the landlords, which is already an incredibly sensitive, exploitive issue in New York, especially with the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I'd say a lot more people benefit than the landlords. I mean, you know, consider a small company of one, you know, the fact that you're able to, to take a desk or take an office in a space and, and, and actually be able to succeed there. And, and, you know, I think an example of, of, you know, what we work has been a huge asset is, you know, a great example is like a lawyer on a floor ends up serving the entire floor um, you know, and, 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 and that would never happen without that opportunity. Um, you know, I think with our, with our landlords, I mean, in, in, in our case, you know, we, you know, we're very much sort of ensuring that, you know, we're building these, these partnerships, but I do think others benefit outside of just the landlords for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, we, we do make our owners more money. Uh, we're very proud of that. Um, that's something we, we talk about and we don't apologize for. I mean, uh, housing exists in a competitive landscape of other uses of capital. And if that site is not getting built for housing, uh, it's probably becoming an Amazon distribution warehouse. It's becoming an office. It's becoming something else. And so if we can make that housing more appealing for an owner or for a developer to build housing there, ideally to build housing where the chunk rent is really, really low for someone coming in, ideally if that's done, you know, as part of an inclusionary zoning program. But that's where is that thousand dollar property that you said where the rent is less than a thousand dollars? Sure, we do it in, uh, that's in Brooklyn, Queens, Seattle, like where DC. In Brooklyn? Uh, 
a number of neighborhoods we offer yeah. have affordable rent. Um, we also have probably over a thousand below market rate units across the portfolio. So we're really proud of you know the returns we're generating as well as the offer uh, the spaces we're offering to consumers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, th I think that's all we have time for. Uh, oh, sorry, is, is your question really quick? Sorry. Actually, it was kind of a follow-on. I, okay. I, think, I think when I interviewed you, Sandy Smith, Philadelphia Magazine. Yes. Uh, I think when I interviewed you early on, you were exploring mainly standalone spaces, but now I see you're managing a lot of properties in you know, conventional rental buildings. Uh, you just had three floors of the... Uh, largest apartment building to be built in Philadelphia last year. Right. Uh, what is the advantage to the property manager of doing this? So in many cases, we are the property manager mm -hmm. of, those, of those buildings. And the first and foremost reason why someone brings us into a situation like that is to basically enable their building to appeal to a somewhat of a different audience mm -hmm. who may not be able to afford it otherwise. So if the, low, if the cheapest studio in a building like that, I'm trying to think, I know what building you're referring to, I think the cheapest studio there might be around 1500 a month. By the way, the building is developed by a New York company. <laughs> so it's, uh, if, 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 if they can offer a, an opportunity for someone to get into that building for 1100 a month mm -hmm. by offering a co-living room, uh, that is suddenly taking them out of competition with the five other buildings next door that just delivered. So there's a real benefit for them to adding some segment of co-living rooms uh, to that building. And that building is so massive, even though we are managing three floors, I think that's 291 units across those three floors, if I'm remembering correctly. It's a massive building. All right, well, thank you so much for being here, guys. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.